I think everyone here should uh, by now know how it works. For the first uh, four minutes of your five-minute talk, the timekeeper shows a green signal, a green a rising LED bar, and then the four minutes are nearly up. It will look like this. And then you have 30 seconds of a uh, yellow light, something like this, and the last 30 seconds of your talk are shown in red. And when it's about this height, I need your help, and you have to make up for all the people still in bed. So give me, please, a countdown with five, four, three, two, one. And marvelous. Very nice, but I think we can do better. Let's do it again. <laughs> do we want to try it again? I don't know. No. We don't have to. That's good. Yeah. I, I, I always have it in the slides. That's uh, okay. Great. <laughs> so we also have translations available. Um, very important. So if you, since some of the talks are German, you might need a uh, German to English translation, and most of the talks are English. You might need a German translation uh, from English to German, and we also have French translations from English to German, uh, from English to French, and from German to French. So just look up streaming.c3lingo.org where you can see the translated streams. All right, then, let's go with the first talk. So first up is where trust ends certificate pinning for the rest of us. Yes, hello, good morning everyone. My name is Heurikus and I have uh, brought a question, an answer, a problem and a solution with me today. The question is, why do I usually trust the web today and why that is sometimes not good enough? So the easy answer is, well, I usually trust the web today and most of you do as well because when you go to HTTPS encrypted web pages, uh, they are encrypted and you implicitly trust certificate authorities to only hand out uh, signatures for certificates only to the owner of the domain and not to anyone else who wants to do a man in the middle attack. So that's what, what you trust today implicitly. The problem with that for some things is, well actually whom do you actually trust? When you go to the certificate manager in Firefox for example, you can see there is well over a hundred root certificates that can be used to sign certificates. So you implicitly trust many, many different entities. For example, the well-known Hong Kong post office, which is, uh, I guess, a running gag. I always thought it was a running gag uh, that you have to trust the Hong Kong post office. But I actually had a look, and it's in there. It's in the certificate manager, the Hong Kong post office. So I have to trust them for everything. Well, for most things, I think that's good enough for me, but for other things, it's not. I don't want to trust the 100 root certificates, for example, for my own websites I have at home, uh, for my banking stuff. And what I had until a couple of years ago, there was a nice Firefox add-on that lets one do certificate pinning, which means you pin the certificate that you have once seen, and then only this one is trusted. And if there is suddenly a new certificate, uh, you get an information that there is a new one and then you can decide if the change was valid or not. So unfortunately, M Mozilla removed this API as part of a big cleansing a couple of years ago and it wasn't possible to inspect the certificate anymore so that add-on went away. Um, and there was nothing for a couple of years. Until back in September 2018, they added a new API uh, to inspect certificates before the web page is loaded. So I thought, okay, cool. Then I write an add-on for that to actually inspect the certificate and uh, to pin it. And if there is a new one, to block it and for people to be able to inspect that. So that's how the API looks like. And that's how the add-on looks like. If you install it, for example, via the Mozilla Firefox store, um, you get a new icon in the browser's taskbar. Um, and when you go to a web page that you want to pin because you don't trust the 100 certif root certificates, uh, you get a little green P there that the page is protected. And whenever you go to that page again or to any other page that you have pinned, 
the add-on looks at the certificate that has been delivered and if it's the same everything goes ahead but if it's a, a new one and a different one you get an alert and then you can choose whether the change has been fine for example because you have changed your own certificate for your own services or if it was the banking website you can look at the certificate chain and decide well that's, that was probably okay or mm, maybe there is something fishy and then you can either go on or uh, you can stop the process before any of your passwords or private information has been transferred to the other side. All right. And that's pretty much it. If you have, want to have a look, you can use the barcode here or the, the URLs down here. Have a look at the add-on. You can have a look at the source code as well, obviously. Certificate pinner add-on for Firefox. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Distri. This tree. Hello, good morning. My name is Michael, and I think that uh, Linux distributions are too slow. So I've measured the time that it takes to install a small Perl script on the major Linux distributions, but this holds true for both smaller and larger packages. And I think it's really unacceptable that on, for example, Fedora, you have to wait 25 seconds to install a couple of kilobytes of program code. So why is it that these package managers are so slow? Well, all of the widely used package formats are actually archives. So in Debian, you have tar archives. In Red Hat, it's CPIO archives. And traditionally, what a package manager in Linux does is it needs to download some global metadata, use it to resolve dependencies, download package archives, extract these archives, and then actually configure the software that was just unpacked onto your computer. On top of that, these package managers need to carefully use the F-Sync system call to make all of this I.O. as safe as possible. So just in case your laptop battery dies in the middle of a package installation, your system should still work once you power it up again. Now in this tree, we have removed all of the stages. We no longer need to resolve any global dependencies. We only need to download image files. We don't need to extract anything. We don't need to configure anything. And due to our design, we can do all of this using unsafe I.O. So this approach scales to 12 plus gigabytes a second on a 100 gigabit link using just a standard Go net HTTP package. So more optimization might be possible. If you compare this with the data rates from the previous slide, which were like 1 point something megabytes per second, and this is a really big contrast. So how can we do this? The key idea is that we're using an append-only package store of immutable images. So we're using an image format, for example, SquashFS in our case, instead of an archive format. Then each of these images we mount under a own path. So this is a concept that we call separate hierarchies. And for example, if you were to install the Nginx web server on your system, you would have a path such as slash arrow for read only and then Nginx followed by the fully qualified version number. The same is true for Zshell and all of the other components on your system, but the rest of the system is laid out as usual. So you have your typical slash Etsy directory for configuration, slash var, and so on and so on. So with these separate hierarchies, you might be wondering, OK, but if you have all of these programs installed separately from each other, how can they still communicate? Because programs do use exchange directories that have a well-known path. For example, if you use your man page viewer to look at the Nginx documentation, it looks up a file within user share man. And if you're using your C compiler to compile against libusb, it looks into user include, et cetera. In this tree, we just emulate these well-known paths, so we have a symlink, for example, within user include, which points to the fully qualified file. The advantages of using separate hierarchies are that all of the packages are always co-installable. So for example, if you upgrade from Zgel 5.6.2 to a newer version and it breaks your config file, you can easily just use the older shell or remove the new one without breaking the rest of your system. But more importantly, this means that the package manager can be entirely version agnostic. So we no longer need to fetch global metadata from the internet and resolve all of these dependencies. Um, so a large source of slowness in installation and upgrades is just entirely eliminated. Furthermore, we don't have any hooks or triggers in this tree. A hook is also sometimes called a maintainer script or a post-installation script. Essentially, it's a program that is being run after a package was installed. A trigger is the same thing, except it's a program that's being run after some other package is installed. For example, the man package in Debian builds a full-text search database of all of your man pages whenever you install any package that has a man page, so almost all the time. And I personally never use this, and I bet most of you haven't even 
even known that it existed. Um, so the work that is being that is doing at package installation time is entirely unnecessary for most of us. More importantly, having hooks in your architecture precludes concurrent package installation because these hooks were not implemented with concurrency in mind. And also they can be slow because nobody checks what the package maintainers are actually shipping in these programs. The claim that I'm making is that we can build a fully functioning Linux system without having any hooks or triggers in it. And the approach that we're doing to get there is twofold. The first idea is that packages just declare what they need. For example, if you have a, a daemon such as the Nginx web server, it might say, I need a new system user so that I can safely run the program as this user. Um, and if you have one off cases where it really doesn't make sense to implement a facility with which packages can declaratively say what they need, then you can still move the work from package installation time to program execution time. So, for example, in the SSH server where you need to generate a host key, you just create it in the SSHD wrapper script instead of creating it at package installation time, which is also good for read only images. So the conclusion is that an append only package store is more elegant than a mutable system, and it results in a simpler design and a faster implementation, so it's win win. Using the exchange directories where I mentioned we have the symlinks for compatibility makes things seem normal enough to third party software. So we can compile unpackaged software, we can run closed source binaries, no problem. All of the ideas that are presented are practical. Live CDs have paved the way with their read only environments and cross compilation. I'm not trying to build a community here or a user base. Distri is a research project. I want to encourage you all to not accept slow Linux distributions. And I just want to raise the bar and say it can be much, much faster. So thank you and check out distri.org. Thank you. Next up is hacking neural networks. Hi all, my name is Michael and I'm working on a small open source course on how to hack into neural networks. Why should IT security care about such stuff? For example, there are a lot of uh, deep learning applications now in um, blue team applications uh, such as anti-virus uh, applications, intrusion detection systems, but Obviously, red teams also need to know how to hack into those systems, and they also need to create their own systems, such as automated penetration testing, phishing email generators, and there are, of course, all this questionable stuff you might think is a valid, uh, valid target, such as mass surveillance and crime forecasting. First, I'll give a short review on the terminology I'm going to use and what neural networks do. Here's a typical neural network. It will take an image from the left side, perform some math on it, and produce an output such as, is this image a cat or a dog? It does this by performing this simple mathematical function on each of its neurons. And this mathematical function uh, is consistent, consists of weights, which are multiplied by the input, and is added to a bias. All this is fed into an activation function, for example here, the ReLU activation function. For example, let's take an access control system based on an iris scanner. It takes an image of an iris from the left, computes what we just saw, and outputs if access is denied or if access is granted, depending on the output value. And this output neuron performs the same computation all the other neurons does, usually with something called a softmax, but we'll just stick with ReLU. So the question now is, how can we modify this so that we will always get access granted to a neural network? Well, it's quite obvious. We can simply just replace all the weights with zero and set the bias to one. Then no matter what iris uh, we feed the neural network, it will always give us access granted. How can we do this in real life? The neural network is usually stored in something called a model file, which we can simply edit. Is this realistic? Yeah, it's actually quite realistic because most um, blue teams don't know how to secure these model files because they are neither code, they don't seem to be a database, and they don't seem to be a configuration file. They're mostly huge, gigabytes in size, and the dev, dev team needs constant write access to it. So it seems kind of weird to secure this in a reasonable manner. And you will always often find that they are quite easily accessible. Of course, there are other methods we can use. As a second example, we can always perform a GPU buffer overflow. For image processing, 
we often find that the preprocessor for the image is also found on the GPU where the neural network is calculated. So you might find a GPU memory layout as it's shown here. And if we simply don't have any bounce checks on the image, we can, of course, overwrite the buffer. And we can overwrite the whole model file and simply set all the weights to zero and only the last bias to one. So is this all realistic? Can we actually do this? Yes, you can. You, if you want some details, you can just follow this link um, where I have the whole article explaining over 10 methods and you will be able to try them all out in different exercises such as uh, backdooring neural networks or how to do a neural malware injection and of course all the stuff I just showed you here. Thank you. Thank you. So next up is cross-site request forgery side channel. Ah. Hi. Hello, good morning. Um, this is not about presenting a shiny new fancy bug, but uh, more uh, about talking about the non-interesting bugs. Uh, so don't get your hopes up. Um, basically, I want to get some feedback from, from the community how to deal with them. <coughs> I guess most of you know uh, cross-site request forgeries. Um, when a user is logged into a web page, um, he has a valid session, and another web page um, tries to um, uh, lure him to, to click a button or something that then sends a post request to the original web page, which would then execute um, something the user does not want. Usually, you protect against this by using cross site request forgery tokens, and um, all the standards and um, Angular or Laravel um, send them along with delete or post requests. <coughs> um, but the RFC does not um, define them for GET requests. But this opens a side channel. If you can monitor network traffic, you can see what uh, resources a user is able to access um, by seeing whether, you, um, whether the user gets a big response with data or a small response with uh, access denied. So um, <coughs> this um, yeah, allows you to map um, permissions from different users if you have access to the um, same Wi-Fi, for example. So this is not like highly classified information, but um, side channel that might be interesting in some corner cases. I talked to the um, Angular people, and for them it's like a non-issue. The standard says, hey, don't do that, um, so they don't. But um, the question I want to ask here is um, how should we deal with this as a community? Should we um, just ignore those things? Um, should we carry third-party patches to our own source code to fix those stuff? Or um, are there any other ways um, that, that we should handle this? For this um, special case, uh, you have several options um, on how to deal with it. But um, yeah, what I'm interested in from in, uh, hearing from you is um, how should we deal with this politically, right? For the um, more um, fancier issues, you can always pressure the vendor into um, fixing stuff. But um, for those minor issues, you can't. And I don't think we should. So um, yeah, please give me your feedback um, on what you think about this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is Emissions API. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Lars. I want to talk about an open source project I'm involved in, which is called Emissions API, and which is about uh, making uh, emissions data from satellites easier to access than just getting data or binary data blobs from the ESA. So, um, this doesn't work. I oh, think you now it, now it works. Uh, so, we are talking about this puppy here. This is uh, Sentinel 5P, uh, a satellite by the uh, European Space Agency, 
Uh, it's part of their Copernicus program, and it's orbiting space and or it's orbiting Earth, and uh, it's gathering data about several uh, emissions, uh, like for example methane or uh, carbon monoxide or sulfur dioxide, and so on and so forth. Um, and the cool thing about this is that all these data are open. Uh, however, the problem with open data, as so often, is that open data does not always necessarily mean that uh, the data is easy to access. So uh, it's a little bit pre-processed, which is nice, but you also get large binary blobs from ESA. So for example, uh, if you want to get uh, data here from, from Leipzig, you would also get data from uh, Antarctica, which, well, uh, you don't really want to do that or really want to have that necessarily. Um, and the other problem is that what you get is uh, large blobs of binary data, so it's nothing you can easily process, for example, uh, at least not as part of a web application. Um, so this is, for example, a single scan of uh, basically the Earth, so one flyover of Sentinel 5P, and you see uh, this is the data you would get in one file you would download. Um, so you would get basically all of the world data and couldn't get uh, something for a single spot. Um, the actual uh, scan looks a little bit different. So uh, this is a representation of a, a single scan line uh, flying here over Germany. Um, and it would be really nice to get actually some parts of this. And this is what we strive to do with the project. So uh, looking at the architecture, we want to make this as easy to access as possible. So just uh, having a simple REST API where you can just say, okay, I want to have data for this point, uh, this geolocation, or uh, for this area, and you would just get back uh, a JSON, either GeoJSON or some statistic information uh, in JSON format, which you can then use uh, in any web application you want to use that in. Um, we built some example applications already. So if you go to our website, emissions-api.org, uh, you could, for example, see this example, um, which is uh, the carbon monoxide emissions uh, of Germany in, in one, over one month. Um, including a little guide how to build this. Uh, a little bit cooler would be something like this. Uh, this is using WebGL and having a 3D representation of carbon monoxide uh, of Germany. Um, we are still limited so far to carbon monoxide, so we started this project about three months ago. Um, and we hope to get this more or less done in, in about three months, so uh, helping to, to uh, increase uh, the amount of projects a little bit and uh, the overall coverage of time a little bit. But um, there's still, or there's already an API to talk to out there and some examples. So if you're interested, go to emissionsapi.org um, or find me or some of the other developers here at the uh, Congress and talk to us about this. All right. Thank you. Next up is X, XWM, Emacs X11 Window Manager. Okay, hello. Uh, so my name is Ellis. I'm a long-time Linux and free and open source software user overall. I've been using Emacs for more than 10 years and NixOS for a couple of years. Also a ham radio operator. I'm here today to talk about uh, what is EXVM anyways, my experience with EXVM and the future of EXVM. <laughs> uh, so EXVM, it's, it's just Emacs, running in full screen, managing your graphical applications. That's it. And uh, this has benefits and disadvantages, so for go both good and bad. Uh, so my experience with the XVM, it began with that it was unimpressive and boring. I'm going to show you a screenshot. This is XVM when it's freshly started. 
it's with my theme of Emacs, and it's just Emacs without window decorations or borders in full screen. But from many years of using Emacs, I have grown very used to the key bindings, the way of managing buffers, and very comfortable using it, which makes it exciting when you have it as a window manager. So here I'm running a bunch of graphical applications. Um, and this trans all the key bindings used uh, for managing Emacs translates to how you manage graphical applications within e EXVM. Uh, so you use the same key bindings when you manage graphical applications as you do when you manage projects or code or other just normal editing or running your terminal within Emacs. So overall, it's been a quite good experience. Uh, most things works. Uh, it's not the best window manager I ever used. Um, it has bugs, plenty of them. Uh, but yes, everything does, more or less. Uh, then we go to the future of EXVM. Um, it doesn't really exist, <laughs> because the future of the Linux desktop is probably Wayland, as most of us probably think, but we're not there yet. And EXVM, it has a few problems with the future. Uh, one of the problems is that Emacs doesn't even run on Wayland yet. Uh, there is a branch for it, uh, so we might get there someday. But then we have the big other problem, like Wayland requires us to build a, compo a compositor, and doing that in Emacs Lisp, I don't know, uh, just getting it to run on Wayland is probably a good start. Then we'll see <laughs> what happens. Um, the year of the Linux desktop might not be this year, uh, might not happen anytime soon, uh, but at, le at least I know many people that are humble about it. But for me, it, 2019 was the year of the Emacs desktop as a window manager. And yeah, to conclude, EXVM is a perfectly decent window manager for long-time Emacs users. Uh, it can be combined with evil mode if you want Vim key bindings. Uh, the experience is most often it works good enough for me, so I'm not switching away from it. Uh, and yes, the future is dark. Uh, you can reach out to me later if you want. Um. Thank you. So next up is uninstall dollar product now. Okay. Well, hello. Good morning. Um, I'm one of the VLC developer. Uh, I'm not security guy, but I know there's some security guys, security guys around. Um, what I would like to talk is that some morning you wake up and uh, you have your mail full of of questions, and uh, on the internet the world is burning because uh, everyone is asking to uninstall your product. And you don't know why, so um, it was last July, probably you, you noticed it. Uh, that was a CVE, highly critical, maximum score, all remote, uh, which was uh, overread uh, in libEML, which is uh, MKV. Uh, and uh, that was uh, filed by CERT Bund, uh, which you may know, uh, and that was uh, sourced from uh, one of our a ticketing system entry, uh, and we had, of course, no embargo on this because it was on a public resource. So we also were not contacted, and it was not verified. So, yeah. So what was about? Uh, what was it about? Uh, well, when your ticketing and your uh, security researchers start to point out to the 
won't commit is uh, something in the meson bit system. Might be something fishy uh, from the start. And um, when we ask, uh, when we say uh, we ask to post it on uh, our security mail list uh, for reason, and um, it doesn't do it. And also, nobody can reproduce. So. He posted it publicly because we never replied it on security because nobody could reproduce. And why was it and not reproducible? Um, his configuration was leap further uh, on our master source code. He was running Ubuntu, but he was uh, using a vulnerable, unfixed uh, libml. Uh, which was no vulnerable, uh, and it did not follow our build instruction because uh, we use a lot of library which sometimes are not maintained, so we have to maintain it by ourselves, and we ship our own patches, uh, mostly for secure OS systems, which are mostly Windows. Uh, so this uh, highly critical CV was uh, totally bogus and already fixed. Um, so there's no mu not much left on uh, that CV entry. Uh, it was totally downgraded. It was not reported by us, not remote at all. But uh, the effect was uh, most annoying thing is the uh, web article, uh, like the recommendation un uninstalled right now, uh, which was not checked. Uh, and all those clickbait articles were spreading like fire uh, in social media also uh, playing the game. So consequences is all, the whole team had to fight for two days uh, to uh, put the fire uh, and monitoring social media and answering all the companies asking us uh, for updates. Uh, we still have some people asking for this. Uh, uh, we also had some people uh, uh, telling us that we were hiding things uh, because some people think we are hiding security issues. Uh, there was almost no article updates on the web, uh, no apologies, and uh, the reporter ran away uh, with a, I'm sorry about that. It's not a problem, uh, it's a volunteer, so even if it's a beginner, it's, it's okay, but we, that's another effect that, that we, we, lo we, lo we lost one volunteer in the, in the process. But we had some unexpected effect that we received some direct complaints about VLC being blocked from that day. And uh, we discovered that some uh, antivirus and proactive security software were based on CVE. So with a bogus CVE, you have your product blocked everywhere with those products. And you need to update the version on the signature, so you have a dose. So this is uh, really unexpected for us. Maybe some could exploit this, <laughs> I don't know. But this needs to be changed. Uh, so the lesson we have is uh, we enforce no more public security ticket. We will de delete it immediately. And we are in the process of being on CNA uh, for the multimedia project we support. So we could uh, manage uh, that kind of issue in the future. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you please put the clicker back? I think you still have the clicker, right? Or do you still have the uh, clicker device? Oh, sorry. Ah, okay. Sorry. Looked like you went away with it. No problem. Uh, <coughs> So next up is doing quantum computing with school kids. So good morning everybody, my name is René, I'm a teacher and I'm here to talk about doing quantum computing with school kids, especially about the project that my three students have worked on this year. So let's start with a question. If the clicker works then the next slide should come up. Maybe a bad time for the battery. Time is running. Okay, I can continue just um, talking a little bit. Um, let's start with a question. Who of you has already worked with a real quantum computer? Can I see some hands? Okay, that's not so many like expected. Maybe it's because you are afraid of the mathematics. So 
So here are some companies that provide you an access to a quantum computer, for example, D-Wave to a quantum manila. But maybe you haven't worked with such machines because you're afraid of the quantum physics that is behind quantum computing, or you are afraid of the mathematics, um, dealing with complex numbers, or solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, or you think quantum computer is only for super intelligent nerds and you don't have the right t-shirt yet for that. Okay, so if we talk about a quantum annealer, all this is, like Donald would say, fake news. It's definitely not so complicated. All you have to do is to find a um, cost function for a given problem because quantum annealer solve optimization problems like the traveling salesman or the schedule problems. So when you have this um, cost function that evaluates your problem, then you have to create a matrix from this cost function, feed it to the D-wave quantum annealer, and this machine will turn, return you several solutions from which you pick the ones with the lowest costs. So let me explain this on a concrete problem, the one on which my students worked, the N queens problem. Here you have to place N queens on an N times N chessboard so that no two queens threaten each other. Um, the constraints you have to meet is, for example, that on one row there have to be exactly one queen. And this can be translated into a cost function like this. So every field on the chess field is represented by a qubit that is either one if there is a queen or zero if the field is empty. So then you can set up this cost function for the row where you add up the four qubits, subtract one and square the result. Then you get the lowest cost, zero, when there is exactly one queen in the first row. And similar, you can set up cost functions for diagonals and columns. And when you put all these parts of the cost function together, you can write it as a matrix equation like this, where Q represents the current configuration on the chessboard, all the qubits that are either zero or one, and H is the matrix of your problem that you get from the cost function. Then you simply feed it to the D-Wave system with a simply Python script like this, and this machine returns you several solutions, and you just have to pick the ones with the lowest cost, and this is your problem solved. So no big deal, no Schrodinger cats lurking around and so on. School kids can do it if they are clever enough, and my students were. So if you want to know more about this project, the students are here, live on stage, uh, at 7 o'clock in Hall 2 at the Chaos Zone Bühne at 7. They will give a talk in more details and be here for questions and answers. And we also have a website where you can look at um, the project documentation. It was a Jugendforsch project. And my students have also given a talk this year at the International Supercomputing Congress in Frankfurt. And this talk was recorded, and you can find it under this link in YouTube. So thank you for your attention, and see you hopefully this evening. Thank you. So next up is OpenCast. So, hi, I'm Lars, you might remember me. Um, I'm also involved in, not only in, TA, in Mission API, but I'm also a main developer of OpenCast, which is a free and open source software for uh, basically video recording, processing, and distribution. And its main focus is on uh, the academic world, so uh, universities recording their lectures, for example. So. Um, the basic idea behind OpenCast is that while here, for example, in this lecture hall, we have dedicated people recording stuff. Uh, as a university, you couldn't do that on a large scale in your, uh, your usual lectures. And you could also not force your lecturers to deal with the technical problems of video recordings. That may work for a very few lecturers who are interested in this topic. 
but for most, it simply don't, and most are really not interested in the technology behind this and in doing that stuff themselves. So uh, having this automated, having an equip room and being able to just schedule a recording for, uh, for a, um, a talk or um, a regular course uh, is immensely helpful, then the recording should happen automatically. It would be processed and you could configure the uh, processing, like uh, you could do video transcoding, you could also do some media analysis, for example, uh, open cost supports, uh, slide detection, um, you can do stuff like uh, uh, text extraction from slides to search through these slides later on or to uh, do speech to text, for example. All these steps are configurable and you can do them. You don't have to do them depending on what you want to achieve. Do you want to uh, push out your sources as fast as possible or do you want to, uh, well, have as many analysis steps as possible? Um, if you want to test this out, you can go to uh, develop.opencast.org, which is a test server, which is reset on a daily basis, uh, which runs the latest development branch of Opencast. Um, there are also other test servers out there, but that one uh, usually works quite well. Um, it's also m up most of the time, so develop is pretty stable. If you happen to break it, please let me know. I can just simply reset it. Um, but usually it's, it's up and working. So um, talking a bit, little bit about open source projects also means that uh, it's also interesting to talk about the community behind these projects. Uh, Opencast is a quite old project by now, so it's about 10 years old and it's uh, used at universities worldwide. Uh, looking at, uh, at Germany here is in specifically, uh, it's actually one of the most used lecture uh, recording solutions out there. So there are some uh, commercial competitors, but uh, I think we are uh, in Germany specifically um, um, above these co uh, commercial competitors. It, uh, unfortunately, not true worldwide, but at least in Germany it is. Um, looking a bit more about this, at the community, this is, for example, the package repository maintained by Opencast. We can re uh, register, and these are the registrations from this uh, package repository, which uh, looks quite nice because you see it's it's used worldwide. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of uh, the people who are registered here uh, are actually. Uh, using Opencast, but it also doesn't mean that you have to register to actually use it. So uh, some dots will probably not use Opencast and others uh, um, will use Opencast but not, are not on this map. But it at least gives you an expression, uh, uh, impression of where Opencast is used. Um, Looking at other community events, you also see that uh, to these community events, uh, a large part of this community shows up. This is uh, for two photos taken in Valencia at the International Summit of Opencast and uh, in, at the Technical University of Ilmenau here in Germany at the local German meeting of, for this project. Um, yeah, if you want to know more about uh, Opencast, you can contact me, talk to me, uh, or talk to the larger German uni uh, community, um, or the international community, for that, um, and uh, just find out ab or about the project. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is... Uh, Cider or Cidre by Food Hacking Base. Oops. Yep. All right, there you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will just try if it works. Yes. Uh, my name is Frantisek Apfelbeck, uh, our goal in Computer World, and I will be presenting Cider. Uh, cider is a beverage, alcoholic beverage from apples, uh, done in, especially in France, England, and the north of Spain. Historically, we know it's around 2,000 years old, let's say. We have the records, uh, the regions I mentioned, science of production in Europe. Uh, I would say that at the moment, uh, England is the bigger, uh, like I say, uh, producer and uh, drinker. Uh, France is behind, and after it's Spain. 
Uh, Quality-wise, I would vote for France because uh, the traditional uh, methods of production are still in place and not even the laws are stricter, but actually somehow whole industry follows the good quality standards more. I'm not sure why, but definitely better than England at the moment for the mass scale. Now, I will talk a little bit about uh, how you do it. Uh, Harvesting, uh, manual versus mechanical. I do manual harvest by the hands on the field, on the knees, in the panier or basket, which I get, you know, in my sacks. Uh, and after that, I have to get it, you know, to the place where I process it, which means 13 kilos in each hand, after it to the back, 25 kilos, a hoop, 200 meters, for example, to my uh, remorque, from the remorque on the place where I do it, and after it, you have to make something with that. You crush it uh, by crusher or wrap, there are different techniques or different machines, or you can do it also by the hand, which you don't want to, if you want to be survival. Uh, you will press it later on. There are many different types of presses, uh, pneumatic ones, uh, press à uh, you would uh, do the, in the Germany the water press, many ways. Uh, after pressing, you may wait for two, three hours for special chemical reactions to take place. You would do couvage, special French technique, still done in most of the production. Uh, after pressing of the mark, you will get, sorry, after pressing of the apple pulp, which is called mark, you can actually add water to get second pressing, like in wine, it will be called remiage. Once you have your uh, mood, uh, your apple juice, you actually would like to do defocation, which in English means shitting, uh, which means basically a purification by the colligation of the pectin. Uh, the solution is clearer, uh, lower on the nitrogen and lower on the yeast cells, so it ferments slower. After that, you would like to do sutirage, uh, which is also called wrecking, which means transfer of the cider from cask to cask or your container or cube to the cube, decreasing the depot on the bottom and decreasing also the amount of the yeast cells and sediments so you can slow down the fermentation. When everything goes well, uh, you will end up with a cider which is actually decent enough to put in the bottle. So you will have to embottle it. If you press in October, November, or December, there's a cider season, you may be, as a traditional maker, uh, harvesting actually or bottling around uh, March or Fe February, March, April. Maybe May, not so good after. You put in a bottles, uh, generally by gravitation, uh, and if all goes well, you will do Pris de Mousse which means you put a cork in, muzzle around, and you hope and pray for a few months that the bottles will be fizzy, but not too fizzy, meaning they will not explode. There are many ways how to screw it up, and uh, most of the time you find one or two on the way. Now, products. You have apple juice, bigger and bigger thing in Normandy actually, where I am now based. Uh, you have cider, uh, which is generally between three to six person in, in uh, Ireland, sorry, in uh, France around four to five. You have a lot de vie, which means a young distillate, which is kept left in the glass, it's not aged. Uh, Calvados, which is, you know, appellation origin, uh, generally around 40, 50%, 40% commercial one. Uh, aged in oak barrels for years, at least two or more. You have vinegar, many times if your cider doesn't go well, it ends up like that. Or you have pomo, which is a melange of Calvados and jus de pomme. Uh, age in oak bars for around 12 months or more. These are the basic products which you can do. Also, you can make some concentrates and play around. You can make the cider a la glace and many other things. Now, you would like to check when you're making cider, the first thing, specific gravity. You press your juice, you check the specific gravity so you know the amount of the sugars, and at the end, you can say how many actually, how much alcohol you get. You check your pH, if you can, nitrogen and calcium in the lab, so your bottles don't explode and your defocation happens. You would like to ferment around eight degrees of temperature if you can, and you check that you don't have too much of bacterial contamination. Because if you do, then you are in trouble and you may get explosions. Now, this would be a very simple overview of cider making. If you want to know more, visit Furekin Base, uh, which is in the hall too. And we can talk, we can taste, we have cider tasting, which is fully booked, but there are some ciders which we can offer and you can have a bit of taste what I do and other people do in the field. Thank you very much and I do hope to see you soon and enjoy the cider in general in your local regions. Thank you, bye. Thank you.
So, next up is uh, Menschen beurteilen. No, let's, let's, uh, wait a minute. Uh, so, this one. He's coming. Hi. So it's actually the opposite of Menschen beurteilen. Um, this is supposed to be a non-judgmental non talk. Um, I use this, yeah? Uh, so we're going in the direction of healing. Um, and for that reason, I'll start by introducing the plan for how we can have healing on Earth. And then I will go into discussing one of the obstacles. So first, the plan. Um, uh, you begin by um, sharing values, and uh, values are word harmonics whose uh, true meaning requires human discourse and intention. So um, there's a lot of values, but um, what's a good example? Like um, uh, Gerechtigkeit oder um, Ehrlichkeit, classic example, like do you um, say that you're hiding fugitives or not? Um, and so there are a lot of word harmonics that we have yet to discover, um, and that's, that's the first step is discovering our values and sharing them. A federation, by the way, in this context is defined as any two people who share values. So it's really easy to federate, just um, share your values. Um, the, next, the second step is to develop a um, healing base a healing basis upon which we develop our work. So humans have been doing it backwards for our entire history. We've been, uh, we take a value like um, leadership or function or you know anything you want and we put it above as a goal and then we try to get to it and we lose our values. So we, and we inevitably don't have the social structures to support the goals. Um, which means that we have to start with a healing basis. Um, so the, the second step is after sharing our values to develop a network of healing. And then the third step is to share that with the world. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the big obstacles, the, this isn't a judgment talk. Um, uh, there's, I had a dream the other day where um, there was a Mexican standoff and everyone had their guns pointed to each other. Um, and the, they, all, they, all, we all, they all grabbed each other's guns, they went off and confetti went everywhere and we were asked, are you a dancer or a judge? And so this is trying to dance more. Um, and the question is, is there a healthy attitude toward the, um, the system in which price is a value? So um, there it is. Um, we're, we'll call it Mr. C, and um, it works for each of us, but um, what's the real issue here? The issue is that price, um, when, w w that the irrational actor has to sacrifice most other values in order to get to the value of um, price, because inevitably it's really clear what has more value, right, price. Um, so, the other problem with that is that um, you're also most willing to have one and then you, again, we lose our values. So we're talking about you've got price value and you've got all the other values and this is a system in which we are asked to focus on price. So obviously there will be problems in things like externalities or thinking about the future Anything that you actually can associate with human values is at risk. Um, so we, ne we need money, we need um, to like, think about people who are not going to be developing a healing system but who we also need to heal um, and we also need to, um, we also need to do this culturally, like um, the, the state is very unlikely to help us as well, this, this needs to come from the heart. 
Um, so the real question is, is peace sexy? Um, I don't know. But price really isn't. Price, uh, Geiz is nicht geil. And, um, right, so it ends up being about developing a basis of healing. And um, the, the main idea is that we, all, we, we, we always develop our work in terms of like a goal and like, make, like making money or developing a great product or something like that. But the, the goal of this is to invite you to think differently and develop every one of your work products in a context of healing. And um, there, there are four ways of looking at that. Um, so I don't have a cool diagram for this, I'm sorry. Um, but you can consider it in a box of four where the two top categories are human and Umwelt, right, environment. And then, and so we're healing the worker and the environment that they work upon. And then we also have to heal um, the deficiencies that are caused by the work and the overabundance that is caused by the work. The trash, maybe the manual labor that hurts the body. But consider every, every work we do in the context of a healing basis that we all have to develop. And then if we develop that healing basis and define all our work within it, then we won't really have any more problems. So um, I think I, it's pretty simple, but uh, I'll be working on it and I'll be in the Echo Hacker Farm. Uh, you can find me there. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Warum wir eine Lieferkette brauchen. And this talk is in German. Ein Lieferkettengesetz, sorry. Stellt euch vor, ihr sitzt äh, in eurem Hackerspace, ihr möchtet irgendetwas löten und ähm, ihr nehmt so einen Widerstand zur Hand. Äh, in diesem Widerstand sind verschiedenste Mater Materialien, verschiedenste Rohstoffe drin, ähm, unter anderem Eisen. Und ähm, dieses Eisen wurde irgendwo auf der Welt ähm, in einer Mine, Mine abgebaut. Zum Beispiel in Brasilien oder so. Also zum Beispiel hier in, in Brumadinho, ähm, wo sich bei einer Eisenerzmine ähm, ein, ein Damm brach und sich dann eine ähm, Giftschlammlawine auf ein Dorf ergoss und über 200 Menschen unter sich begrub. Ähm, der, der Damm ähm, wurde kurze Zeit vorher noch als sicher zertifiziert und zwar vom TÜV Süd, also einer deutschen Firma. Und inzwischen gibt es Hinweise, dass ähm, bei der Prüfung schon Sicherheitsmängel aufgefallen sind und der Minenbetreiber dann Druck ausgeübt hat, ähm, die Zertifizierung dennoch zu erteilen. Bislang ist es für die Opfer bzw. deren Angehörigen ziemlich schwer, sehr kompliziert, ähm, zum Beispiel gegen den TÜV Süd gerichtlich vorzugehen, weil sie offensichtlich hier ähm, nicht sorgfältig gearbeitet haben. Ähm, denn die Angehörigen sitzen in Brasilien, der TÜV Süd sitzt in Deutschland. Äh, kleiner Einschub, die Bundesregierung hat eine, na, in diesem Jahr eine Umfrage durchgeführt unter deutschen Unternehmen, wie sie es mit den Menschenrechten so halten. Die Frage war, ob sie menschenrechtliche Sorgfaltspflichten ähm, entsprechend der gängigen Regelwerke umsetzen. Und von den Unternehmen, die geantwortet haben, tun das ungefähr 20 Prozent. So viel zum Stand der Menschenrechte in der deutschen Wirtschaft. Ähm, deswegen gibt es die Initiative Lieferkettengesetz, und die möchte ich euch heute vorstellen. Ähm, das ist ein breites zivilgesellschaftliches Bündnis, das von vielen großen Organisationen von Brot über die Welt, ähm, über Greenpeace, wir sind zu Verdi, getragen wird und von noch viel mehr unterstützt und ähm, verbreitet wird. Und ich möchte euch die Kernaussagen dieser Initiative kurz vorstellen. Ähm, wer Schäden anrichtet, muss Verantwortung übernehmen. Wenn ein Unternehmen ähm, äh, im, im Ausland wirkt, zum Beispiel indem es ähm, 
in einer unsicheren Fabrik seine, seine T-Shirts herstellen lässt oder eben indem es Zertifizierungen unrechtmäßig erteilt, ähm, dann muss es dafür auch zur Verantwortung gezogen werden können. Verantwortungslose Unternehmen dürfen keinen Vorteil genießen. Ähm, den genießen sie derzeit, weil sich Geld sparen lässt, wenn man wegschaut und Menschenrechte missachtet. Und diese Situation ähm, können wir nicht dulden. Verantwortung darf nicht auf VerbraucherInnen abgewälzt werden. Ähm, die Frage, ob Menschenrechte geachtet werden sollen, ist keine, die jeder von uns hunderttausend Mal im Einzelnen ähm, beantworten muss, sondern Menschenrechte gelten für alle. Und deswegen können wir als Gesellschaft ein für alle Mal gesetzlich festlegen, dass Menschenrechte zu achten sind. Ähm, Betroffene von Menschenrechtsverletzungen brauchen Zugang zu Gerichten in Deutschland. Es darf nicht, es muss völlig selbstverständlich sein, dass wenn jemand im Ausland durch das Handeln eines deutschen Unternehmens zu Schaden kommt, ähm, dass diese Person auch in Deutschland gegen das Unternehmen gerichtlich vorgehen kann. Freiwillig ändern Unternehmen zu wenig. Wenn sich Unternehmen zu freiwilligen Bündnissen zusammenschließen, dann sind das zu häufig zu kleine Schritte, die die ähm, eigentlichen Probleme nicht beseitigen. Wenn, wenn, ihr euch für die, ähm, wenn ihr mehr über die Initiative erfahren wollt, dann schaut mal auf lieferkettengesetz.de. Äh, da findet ihr eine ganze Menge Infomaterial, ähm, findet auch nochmal die genauen Forderungen ähm, und könnt dort auch online eine Petition unterschreiben, die dann der politischen Lobbyarbeit der Initiative zusätzliches Gewicht verleiht. Dankeschön. Danke. Thank you. So, uh, hello, I'm Felix Peterson, um, and I want to present uh, some of my research, PIX to VEX, Unsupervised 3D Reconstruction. So, what did I do? What is 3D Reconstruction? We start off with an image, for example, of this shoe, and we want to reconstruct the 3D model that underlies the structure so that we can, oh, the GIFs are not working. That's really bad. Okay, so it should rotate and it should show the uh, 3D model. Um, and I want to do this unsupervised, so the 3D model is not given. Uh, here I have two examples. So we have a neural network that is trained to um, reconstruct a 3D model on the right from the respective images on the left. But now the new thing is that the uh, 3D model is not supervised. So we uh, cannot say whether the reconstruction was correct and in which direction to train the neural network to give an appropriate reconstruction. And like a school class, uh, if it's unsupervised, it um, <laughs> um, gets a bit chaotic. And I want to show uh, to you that it's still possible to do the reconstruction. And you might wonder, it might be magic or something, but I want to show you that it's science uh, which underlies this 3D reconstruction, and that uh, can really work. So we start off with an image, for example, of this bunny, and then we do a reconstruction. So what exactly uh, happens here in the reconstruction is not so important. Um, what's really important is how we can supervise whether our reconstruction is correct. So we do a rendering of that, but there we need to uh, be a bit cautious because we need to uh, still put it into the neural network. So we cannot just do rasterization. And thus uh, we need a smooth rasterization and a smooth Z buffer. So the result will also be a smooth image. And there we have the problem our round trip doesn't really work. So if we try to train on that, it will not converge and it will. Uh, crash. So we need to re reconstruct the uh, texture and the style of the uh, image. And how do we do that? We use a pix-to-pix -pix network. So uh, for example, when I dr uh, drew this cat, I could just uh, apply a pix-to-pix -pix network to make a photorealistic image of a cat. Then I've drawn the uh, city Hall of Leipzig, and also the City Hall of Leipzig looks quite cute <laughs> as a cat. Um, you might wonder why it is a cat. So always uh, the left side in the training data were these edges, and on the right side there was also a, always a cat. So no matter what you put in on the left, a cat comes out. 
and if you put in the CCC logo, then you will get it as a cat. If you input bread, you'll get cat bread, and if you input this, you'll get a multi-eyed <laughs> alien, cat alien. And if you want to try that at home, you can just uh, Google for pigs to pigs, and you will find a website where you can try it out yourself. So with this component, uh, we have this uh, round trip, and we come back to the original image, and then we train this, and unfortunately, it still crashes. So wh why is that? We have here a lot of components, and if we just put them on top of each other, there's no way uh, that should be a crashing building. So <laughs> um, the uh, entire architecture crashes if it's too many uh, steps after each other. So how do we stabilize that? We stabilize that using GAN, but not the GAN that we use in microchips, but instead using the generative adversarial network where we have a counterfeiter which uh, forges money. Then we have a bank who has a hobby and it wants to print money. So it gets money, but uh, then we have the discriminator or the detective who uh, discriminates real money from fake money, but over time he gets better detecting the money from the counterfeiter, but then the counterfeiter gets better at forging the money. So in the end, the counterfeiter can forge the money better than the, than the uh, bank can print the money, and at this point, the uh, um, texture can also be reconstructed. So if we apply this concept on this uh, round trip, we can train this stable, and here are some results. On the left side, there are the input images, and on the right side, there are uh, renderings of the reconstruction. And to show that this also works on real images and on single images, I've gone to a website and downloaded 50,000 images of shoes. And then I've trained it only on these images of shoes, which were camera captured. And as you can see, it was still able to do a three model reconstruction of that. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can come up after the talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I still have to get that cat image out of my mind. Uh, all right, next up is BulkCon 2020. Good morning. Do you know how it looked like when the guy turned a badge into a taser? Or how bad hackers are at karaoke? Or how it looks like when you call an elevator in US? If you don't know, then you have to join the next Balkan. Hi, I'm Jelena. I am co-founder of Balkan. Uh, Balkan is Balkan Computer Congress that's held la it's now annual event in Serbia, in Novi Sad. We are not living anymore in Serbia, but we want to contribute to our home country. So that's why we started organizing something there. Novi Sad, why Novi Sad? It's our hometown. Very beautiful, 80 kilo kilometers from Belgrade. Very nice. Some key facts about con Congress. Uh, we started 2030 as a small conference. It was around, let's say, less than 100 people, 20 speakers, something like that. The, up to seven years, we grew up to five, uh, 500 visitors, and we have more than 40 speakers in more than 20 countries. Some of the highlights from the Balkan that were our guests, and that maybe it's interesting, and that they are supporting us now, it's Travis Goodspeed, Virus, Zoz, Mitch Altman, Robert Simmons. There is a lot of them, numbers. You can name it. We try to give them the best. Uh, what's good at Balkan that you can also join us planning CTFs. So if you want, there is a CTF you can play with us. But also, what's also interesting is that we also have a Hebocon. So we started this year and we found it very interesting, and we will continue it. If you have any questions, how to reach there, 
or because I know it's Serbia, it's not so popular place, did not people not visit it yet, but if you want to find out how to reach us, you can visit us at Balkan Assembly or you can contact or you can send us an email, we'll rather help you. Because I, we think that more people have come from abroad to visit our small conference because we are building community in Serbia and in South Europe. So we want to show them how it looks like. And I think that's important. There is, not so much, there is a lot of students there that are not, don't have so much money to travel and it, that's one of the reasons why we started this. Because in Novi Sad you have a big, very big technical university and with a lot of students, young people, that are interested in techniques and hacking. So the key facts from this whole story is Balkan, to, Balkan 2020, 25th, 26th, 27th September, that's for remembering, Novi Sad, Serbia. You have the web page for others, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is a, a concise introduction to double entry accounting. All right, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to skip the intro today because I've already done that yesterday. My name is Luis, and we're going to talk about double entry accounting. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, um, has been known for a few centuries. It's what you use by accountants today. And the way I'm going to frame it is heavily influenced by my use of new cash. OK, so accounting lets you track money movements across accounts. And we have five different types of accounts. Type 1, assets. Assets accounts hold the money that you have in your bank accounts, but it can also be like a physical asset that you can evaluate the value of. Type number two, expenses. Expenses accounts hold the money that, you've, that you have spent. Okay? Type number three, income. Income accounts hold the money that you have received from, for example, a salary. Type number four, liabilities accounts. They hold the money that you owe to someone else. It can be any form of debt. And type number five is a bit more abstract. It's called equity. You have to imagine of equity as the global wealth in the world from which your own money is part of. And you use the equity accounts to set the initial value, the initial balance of your assets accounts. You take the money that you have from the world that you know is yours, and you use that to open your balances on your assets accounts. Accounts form a hierarchy. And you can see on this picture on the left that the top level of the hierarchy corresponds to the five different types I've laid out before. Now, let's take an example of what money movements look like in the balance track accounting. In this example, I have four different, four different accounts, right? An account that represents my wallet, that's assets, cash. An account that represents my checking bank account, that's assets, checking. An, ex an account for categorizing food expenses, that's expenses, food. And an account to categorize uh, banking fees, that's expenses, fees. Let's add two transactions in those accounts. We can see that the, the first transaction at the top is a $20 withdrawal from the bank, and I've incurred a $3 fee, which is a very common thing in the US. And then, with the money in my wallet, I've used that to buy some food. Within transactions, we have a further concept called splits. A split is a debit, meaning you like take money out of an account, or a credit, meaning you put money in an account, right? And so, for example, in the first transaction, we have three splits. On the left, we have the $20 credit to my wallet. Then after that on the right, we have the minus $23 out of my checking account. And then on the right on the first transaction, we have the $3 fee. Same thing for the second transaction. A fundamental property of double entry accounting is that within each transaction, all the splits, if you add them, all the debits, of, like all the splits, which are debits and credits, if you add them, they sum up to zero. Right? And that's super interesting because it means that with this rule, you cannot make money appear or disappear. The balance track accounting is very much like chemistry. You cannot invent elements from nowhere. Nothing appears. Everything gets transformed. It's exactly the same concept. Likewise, if you add all the splits in the other direction, like meaning all the splits in a single account, you actually get the, account, the balance of that account, right? So in my wallet, I had like a $20 credit, uh, uh, credit and then an $8 debit. And so my balance in my wallet is $12. You can do this for all the other accounts. Um, this property is reflected, like that zero sum trick is reflected in the accounting equation. 
the accounting equation lets you calculate how much money you actually have. And you basically, it's like net worth. Net worth means how much money you actually have. And it's just a simple subtraction. You take all of your assets and you subtract all of your liabilities. So you take all the money you have and you subtract all the money that you owe. And that tells you like how much money you actually have. And new cash displays that at the bottom of the uh, uh, account hierarchy. Um, then I'm going to give you a few tips about new cash. Uh, the documentation is split in two. There is a help manual that's about the interface itself. And then there is a concept manual that dives deeper into what I've explained today and yesterday. And it covers accounting and like how to like different accounting methodology and so on. And I find this manual, the concept manual, is much more helpful than the manual about the interface. Then I have some like new cash tips. Uh, this is non exhaustive. I'm not even going to go through it. But I think my favorites one are, and it's not included, the first one is not included, is that when you start using new cash, do not try to import all of your transactions, all the history that you have in your bank. Just start from today, take how much money you have in your accounts, set that at the opening balance, and go forward. Don't spend like days trying to import all of your history. It doesn't like really matter. Then like one of my favorite like, tips are use a mobile app to track your cash expenses. Right? There is one on Android that's like super the better project, and there is another one on iOS that's a bit harder to use, but it's fine. Um, yeah, the new cache is a very mature piece of software. Like the interface, like some people tell me they gave give them the eye cancer. Like new cache didn't give me eye cancer. It's clunky, but it doesn't matter. Accounting hasn't changed in like centuries. Like it's fine, it works. Um, I feel I find it cool to be able to like back up a version of your like accounting books. So like that's what new cash the file that your cash gives you, like archives that, that's cool. Um what else? Um yeah, make sure like unlike other things at Congress, like accounting is something you cannot really hack. If you're hacking it, you're doing it wrong. You need to understand what you're doing. And that's about it. I can help you set up new cash anytime today or tomorrow. Feel free to contact me and that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is your crowd. Okay. Uh, hey guys, my name is Till. I'm part of a small group of uh, legal professionals, and we want to present you a small idea of ours, uh, which we call your crowd. So um, this talk uh, is going to be about the legal tech market in Germany, a problem that we see where of possible monopolization or oligopoles and a solution that we call your crowd and that way. So uh, we start with the legal tech market in Germany as such. Um, it started in the 1970s with legal informatics where we just tried to bring this together, informatics and legal professionals, because the legal language is basically pretty rule-based, so you can try to automate this very simply. Uh, but in the 1970s, we had storage capacities, capacities which were limited, and also the computing capacity was limited. So um, we had lots of ideas, but we just could not implement it, which changed around like 2011 till 2017, where lots of companies popped up. And they put up some nice tools on the market where it's, it's not rocket science. It's mostly about text analysis, text recognition, and you try to automize simply legal analysis. Um, but that lead to a lot of efficiency on the legal market because some lawyers could simply, they had a lot of repetitive work and now they can try to automate it um, via legal tech and save their time. So some lawyers uh, reduce their working time by 70% having the same income as such and now they spend 70% on pro bono work which they could not do before. And another thing is that we now have a greater access to justice. An example is flight right. No one cared about flight delays before flight right, and now even we have a new system with Avocado, and they get you your money back from your flight delay even for free. Um, so, um, and these are a lot of companies that work in that market. Well, what's the problem that we see there? It's not necessarily the, the technique as such, even if we can dis discuss it, but it's more where that comes from. Because at the moment, it's more that startups with a lot of venture capital and a lot of big law firms um, who are outsourcing their development implement that technique. And they have a lot of money to produce the products that they want. Um, and they produce mainly software which is specialized for small law firms. Um, or their law firm and which is made perfectly for their firm either if the workers in the law firm work with the software internally and make it perfect or externally. Um, and they invest mostly in software and their own workers to do so. But small law firms 
cannot do that, really. Um, so because they have no money, no time to do that, and they um, don't have the capacity of big law firms which can work collaborative with IT specialists and have very big teams to work on that. Problems, they only have individuals um, who have an IT interest maybe in the law firm who try to implement that thing. So some of them are a bit upset about that. Um, because we might get new dependencies because big law firms try to implement their software, license it to small law firms. And on that way, um, these products get in some way pretty expensive. And on the other hand, um, also, the big law firms get on the market of the small law firms because big law firms before just focused on the big cases, not on the small ones that small law firms took care of. And now they get in that market. And it might be the chance that we get something like Google on the legal market. Um, it's, it's not necessary that will happen, but it might, might be the case, um, which is not necessarily new that we have these dependencies because in law, we don't have uh, a system of open knowledge as in other sectors. We have two privatized search engines like Beck and Juris um, for legal knowledge, and they're pretty expensive. Yeah? But with legal tech now, we might get just new dependencies by automizing your processes in your legal law firm, or you just might disappear from the market if you don't use their techniques. Um, so we were thinking, okay, how could you change that? And we looked in practice and we saw, okay, in informatics, you just use GitHub to share knowledge. You just talk about what you're doing, which lawyers at the moment don't do. They don't share knowledge. Um, we have projects like GaiaX where they try to upload lots of documents in the cloud, um, even if you don't like the cloud as such. But the idea to share documents is interesting, and we know that we can um, distribute work, even if we don't like captures, but it shows that we can distribute work over a huge crowd and get things done. And uh, we saw this guy. This is Joseph, and he was able to um, predict um, court cases or, well, doesn't matter, I just skip that. Um, but our idea is, well, we just combine expert systems like lawyers, let them form a crowd, a group to share their knowledge, their documents, um, maybe use algorithms like machine learning to get something out of their documents which we have not seen before and let them try to distribute the work to develop their own techniques which they want, like a like we have it with GitHub, with informatics, bring the lawyers together and let them share their knowledge, all they have, and maybe let them form collaborative teams so they can work. And if you want to help us, Four, three, two. contact us. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, next up then is there's JavaScript in my power plug. Hey, I'm Harry. Welcome to my talk. There's JavaScript in my power plug. I will tell you the story how I found my first CVE. Wait a minute. Uh, you pressed the wrong button, I think, because you are. Don't press anything right now, please. <laughs> uh, now, go ahead. To the right. Yeah. Because working. Yeah. Uh, one day I walked through a supermarket and found a smart IoT power plug and it promised it can be controlled via an app from all around the world. And I thought, hey, um, maybe I'm able to control it without the app or somebody else is able to control it also. So um, I started reverse engineering it. First we dumped the flash image and saw some JavaScript flowing through our terminal. So one of my colleagues said, hey, there's JavaScript in my power plug. Um, then we used simple to tools like strings to um, analyze the binary and found that there are clear text Wi-Fi credentials in the flash image, which is also a very interesting point. So we used Jira to reverse engineer it and to search for bugs and especially for the configuration interface where the JavaScript comes from. So details to the CVE. Um, it is a bug in the USR Wi-Fi 232 module. It is like kind of a shitty ESP. And it is in the configuration interface um, where you can obtain status information, do firmware updates. And this configuration interface also renders a list of nearby Wi-Fi networks where you connect to. Um, so what you see on the bottom is the source code. Maybe you already have an idea about the bug because if you open a Wi-Fi network with a malicious SSID nearby, 
So if you put JavaScript in your SSID and somebody opens the configuration interface and reloads the page, then this JavaScript gets executed and we have a cross-site scripting attack. Um, this can be utilized by loading a more complex script from an external server and within just this JavaScript we can then do an HTTP get, uh, HTTP get request to the web interface page where the Wi-Fi credentials are inside and append this result to a request to a domain we control or for example to requestcatcher.com so we can leak the Wi-Fi credentials um, from the home network where this uh, module is locked in. Um, this looks like uh, that. On the right side you can see the uh, JavaScript exploit code. Um, it is not very well written but enough to show the concept. On the left side you can see the request catcher. Um, the sensor part is the password and um, below this you can see that it's also possible to leak the username and password of the web configuration interface itself. So some words to the disclosure process. Um, it is a Chinese company from Shenzhen who produces this module and they didn't react to any of our emails. So we requested a CVE from cve.mitra.org. Um, I'm, cu I'm currently doing this lightning talk and I also write a blog post at Tilda Home. So a short conclusion, um, if you use this module in your Wi-Fi network, it is possible to steal the Wi-Fi credentials via a cross-site scripting export by opening a Wi-Fi nearby with a malicious SSID. Next step could be um, to gain code execution. In the code there are a lot of sprintfs without a uh, length check and seems like they wrote their own protocol parsers for example an own DNS parser and custom protocol parsers. Um, we expect some buffer overflows to be found there. Um, which can be exploited. So if you want uh, details and the proof of concept code um, you can have a look at the blog post or you can contact me via email or DECT. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next up is Malware Research Telegram Group. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Uh, this will be a short lightning talk about a open research group we have on Telegram. Uh, there are currently nearly three and a half thousand members in here. So first up, I'll tell you really short something about myself, what the group is and how you can join. And I think that should all fit within five minutes. So my name is Max Kersta. I go by the nickname of Libra. I'm one of the administrators of the group. Um, I worked as a malware analyst before and currently I work as a threat intelligence analyst. I write my own blogs uh, and tools which I also discuss in the group together with other people who also do similar things. So what is it? It's a public group meaning anybody can join. There's no vetting, no invite process. The last slide will contain the join link for whoever wants to join. Uh, we're strictly white hat. We don't do pwning of anything. Uh, we just analyze the malware, help each other out when we have questions. Uh, the tar target platform you have or the architecture doesn't matter too much. There will always be someone who can help you out. So you can have a couple of goals when you join the group itself. Uh, you can stay up to date on the latest news and developments. Uh, new tools that are being released uh, are also published in here. You can learn from the questions of others. Maybe someone else is stuck with a problem you never had or never encountered by chance uh, but you might have use of in the future. You can collaborate with people. Uh, there's multiple small groups that split off that did small things. Uh, I created a group, a small subgroup uh, myself with a couple of people I know in there. We have some projects running. You can ask any question you like as long as it's related. Uh, we have a weekly item. Uh, the current week is week two for the running of this uh, where we in this case for example discuss things that you within your company or experience uh, changed within a company or with, uh, within a network and see what had the benefit out of that so we can all learn from each other there. Uh, there is a pinned message with resources. 
these resources uh, vary. Uh, some of them are how to obtain new samples, some of them contain tips and tricks, some of them contain posters. But in general, there's a, a list of resources that you can use. The rules are also described in there. Uh, the TLDR of the rules is be excellent to each other and, and don't do anything weird. Um, the group consists of uh, students and professionals alike. Uh, I don't believe there's much of a difference uh, aside from some experiences in some cases, but it's open to anybody who wants to join. Um, as a last remark, at the end of all lightning talks, so they end at 13.45, uh, we'll be having a, a first meetup at the left exit of Borg, uh, starting from around 13.45 uh, till uh, 1400 is the gathering, I guess, and then if there is enough people, we'll just move somewhere, and if not, we just stay there, uh, since we don't want to block the exit for others. If you want to join, this is the join link. Uh, you can also search within Telegram uh, for malware research, and you should find this one. Uh, you can take pictures, you can write it down, uh, do whatever you want with it, and uh, hope to see you either in the group or uh, at the uh, exit after all lightning talks. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is privacy mail. Um. There we go. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, I'm going to be telling you something about uh, Privacy Mail. It's an uh, email privacy platform that uh, we developed at TU Darmstadt. Uh, we is uh, myself, Stefan Schwer, and uh, my professor Matthias Hollick. Um, and also, uh, yeah, so. Um, your first question might be, wait, email tracking? I mean, usually when we talk about email privacy, we talk about uh, Alice and Bob wanting to exchange a message, and we don't want like all of the evil people that are on the wire and in the servers to know about it. Um, this is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fact that the sender of the message wants to actually know if the recipient of the message has read the message. So it's not private communication between two people. It is, for example, Amazon sending you a newsletter and wanting you to click links. Um, when you want to track emails, um, there's usually uh, three different things you can do. You can track views, so you can track it by, for example, including remote images or remote style sheets, and then when the email is opened with remote content enabled, uh, a request will be sent to the server of the anal anal bleh, analytics company, and uh, they will know that uh, you opened the email. The second thing is you can track interactions. Uh, this usually happens by using personalized links. So you have a link that is only used in this specific email to this specific person, and if that link is clicked, you know that this person clicked this specific link in the email. Fairly straightforward. And finally, you can also link identities, because if you think about it, you have your emails usually on your laptop and on your phone, and then you will have um, like all of the nasty web tracking that is going on um, which will have a profile of you on your phone and a profile of you uh, on your laptop. But if you click the same link or a link with the same identifier uh, both on your laptop and on your mobile phone, then this can be used to link the identities that they have. So they can basically merge the profiles from your phone and from your laptop. So this is actually fairly interesting. So um, depending on who you ask, between 24 and 85% of emails contain tracking. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, the person sending you the email knows if you opened the email, when you opened the email, which device you used, um, which software you used, so Thunderbird, Webmail, whatever, and where you were based on loose IP-based geolocation. Of course, always if you have remote content enabled and click links and all of this stuff. So uh, we built a software that is intended to uh, detect this kind of tracking and uh, make sure that um, you basically know what you're getting into when you register to a newsletter. And to do that, you go to our website, uh, privacymail.info, and you tell us, look, I want to sign up this specific service, like example.com. And then we give you an email address that only belongs to this service. You sign it up with that service. Um, the service will send us the opt-in message. We will check that there's no shenanigans going on and then um, confirm the registration of the newsletter. Please don't try to register accounts. We will not click confirmation links. Thank you very much. Um, and then we will receive the newsletters. Um, and with these newsletters, we of course receive them on our email server and then get them into our crawler. Our crawler uses OpenWPM, which is an, uh, basically a variant of Firefox that you can remote control and that is intended for online privacy research. 
And with that software, um, we then open the email, also click a link, track all of, the, um, all of the interactions that are happening, so all of the requests that are being sent and so on. The results are, of course, written into a database, and then we have an analyzer that um, basically creates the results that we can then display on our website. So this is a subset of what you can see on our website. Here you can see, for example, if you read the newsletter from spiegel.de, you will see that there is um, four external parties that are contacted when you open the email, um, including um, Spiegel themselves, but also newsletter to go IOAM, which is a, some sort of German tracking company. And uh, similarly, when you click a link, there is also um, additional third parties that are being uh, included in basically a long redirect chain until you reach your final destination. Um, I actually gave a longer talk on this topic at uh, GPN this year. So if you're interested in more details, um, take a look at this talk. You can also find the link to that um, down at the bottom at this mars.xyz slash talk slash GPN 2019. You find the slides, you find the paper, everything. And of course, a link to the platform. Um, with that, so you can play with the platform at privacymail.info. It is, of course, open source. So you can also send pull requests or take a look at uh, what it looks like. And right now, I have a student who is working on redesigning the interface. And for that, we would be really interested in finding out um, like what your priorities and concerns are when it comes to email tracking. Is it worse if they track which links you click? Is it worse if they, click, uh, if, if they track if you open the email and so on? So if you have like three minutes of time and are willing to like fill out a survey, you would help us a lot in uh, making this redesign. And with that, thank you very much. I'm running around here at Congress. Feel free to talk to me. Thank you. Next up is OpenH. So, hi. Uh, we are the OpenH maintainers, and this is our yearly update talk. OpenH is a free engine clone of Age of Empires 2. Uh, we are uh, trying to provide the original look and feel of the game. Um, for that, uh, we uh, need to use the original assets since we are no artists, uh, but we plan to support free replacement asset packs. Uh, the project was started six years ago when we didn't really know what we were doing, uh, with the main goal of providing unlimited extension possibilities, uh, think about uh, support for more than eight players, uh, actual sane networking stack, or like really crazy map, uh, mods like a zombie survival pack or whatever. Uh, there is a lot of uh, similar projects for other classic games, which you can see conveniently listed here. Um, the game is uh, based on C++ 17 with uh, Python 3 used for scripting and Scython for the glue layer. So uh, Age of Empires is still very active even in 2019 um, because yeah, Microsoft just released the definitive edition with vastly enhanced graphics and uh, a fancy new UI. Um, yeah, we're not quite far, but we're getting there. And uh, this year we uh, mainly had a documentation overhaul with uh, fancy Sphinx stuff, defined uh, our modding API, um, started the conversion of the original game to that new API, have continuous integration for macOS and Windows, nightly builds for those and Linux, and we have world first uh, SMX, SMP conversion for the um, definitive edition graphics. So with that we can uh, extract, uh, for example, uh, Asia graphics set assets. Then we have uh, nightly builds uh, hosted for convenient download and uh, also continuous integration now uh, based on AppWayer. The documentation now looks also way uh, fancier and is easier to browse and read. Mm, maybe you remember from our previous talks that our configuration system was this uh, domain-specific Neon language. Um, we now need to use that to create uh, asset packs. Um, in order to create those, we have to convert the original uh, Genie engine data to our engine, and this is the structure of the converter. So we convert uh, the data to intermediate objects, which we then uh, basically export to our format. 
and uh, in parallel we can export the uh, media files, the images and uh, sounds. Our goal engine architecture looks roughly like that. So we have a separation between uh, the simulation of the game world and the presentation of this uh, game world. Um, and uh, so the next steps to uh, reach that is to actually implement the presenter and uh, extend the simulation engine for um, the actual gameplay features. Then we need scalable pathfinding because, yeah, we want to support many, many units. Um, and also think about uh, how we do that over network. Um, with uh, the scripting API, we uh, need to introduce Python stuff so that also uh, artificial intelligence uh, programming can be done with fancy machine learning, whatever you like. Um, in the past year, we had, uh, in the past years, we had 140 contributors. So if you have uh, some interest in joining, we'll always be happy about you and you can crunch some issues. Um, to reach us, you can either visit us at our assembly or join one of our uh, chat rooms or write on uh, whatever platform else we have. We also have a blog where we occasionally post status updates, um, whatever is going on in the project. So uh, in case you want to check us out, uh, here are the GitHub links and we'd be happy to see you contributing. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is B-Sides Amsterdam. Hi. Um, uh, B-Sides is a, com uh, a community-led conference for people involved in security. And uh, local organizers create their own instance in the city. And so last year, I discovered B-Sides. Uh, and there was an event which was going to be hosted in Amsterdam. And they'd been hosting it for the last two years. And I thought, that's where I want to go. But of course, it didn't happen. So I decided uh, to make sure that it's going to happen. This year, I'm going to actually be involved in organizing it. So uh, I'm going to, so we're, oh, we have a, uh, we have a call for papers this year. So if you want to, uh, if we're going to hold it at the end of, over the end of April. So if you want to be involved, if you want to, uh, contribute to uh, contribute, and if you want to get it out, whether you're in the Netherlands or in Germany or Belgium, then you're welcome to come and visit and see and talk. Uh, so send, your send, your, send us your proposal uh, before, uh, before the end of February, and uh, perhaps we can see, uh, I can see your talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, then next up is let's invent futuristic sleep and dream technologies. Hello, um, I'm Christopher and uh, welcome to my uh, lightning talk let's invent futuristic sleep and dream technologies. Um, so wouldn't it be cool to go to sleep and wake up with new knowledge or skills so for example go to bed and in the morning, next day, you uh, suddenly speak Spanish or speak a new programming language. Um, or to have quite high quality, restful sleep, no matter where you are. Or to maybe have some immune system boosting sleep, so maybe you have a cold like, like I have at the moment, and you just go to sleep and uh, it doesn't take seven days, but it just takes one night until you are healthy again. Or maybe cure other diseases overnight. Or maybe even have interactive dreaming, so um, be able to talk from within your dreams to the waking world or maybe to other dreamers. Um, there are many other ideas that can be thought of about uh, how the future of our sleep and dream experience might look like. And actually, I'm looking for people who want to invent these kind of futuristic sleep and dream technologies uh, together with me. Um, not for the money, so this is strictly non-profit, um, but uh, just to... Uh, improve the sleep and dream experience of potentially billions of people and of course also to have fun while developing these uh, crazy things and uh, making things possible that are seemingly impossible. And yeah, it might take decades uh, to invent this uh, kind of uh, stuff, so learning a new knowledge, a uh, new language for example during sleep, but um, well, why not start today and move closer to this uh, goal uh, step by step. And 
So actually, I've started already um, with uh, this uh, project, uh, set up a small website, and uh, also connected to professional sleep and dream researchers. I also conducted some first studies with them and also started publishing the results in peer-reviewed journals. Um, also developed some stuff and um, also I uh, recycled some old stuff from my PhD which was actually about sleep research. I was a sleep laboratory manager at a university for some years and um, now after this time I just do this as a hobby anymore. And yeah, but uh, so some things have been prepared but the real fun is starting only now so actually really inventing these kind of things, uh, getting some uh, ideas what could be done um, and uh, also then to find ways to make this possible somehow. And yeah, so if you uh, find this interesting and uh, if you want to get involved into this, because maybe you have some ideas uh, what could be done, what should be done, also what maybe should not be done uh, about futuristic sleep and dream experiences, or if you want to develop some uh, hardware, software, printed circuit boards, whatever, um, or if you have some other skills that might be of help, or even if you don't really know what uh, and when and how to do uh, stuff that uh, could contribute to this, then please uh, get in touch with me uh, either uh, via email. So I've created this uh, email address, futuristic sleep dream text at protonmail.com, uh, or talk to me here at the conference, and I'm really happy to uh, hear from as many as possible from you. And uh, if you first want to read more about it, then there's this website, sd20.org, which uh, stands for Sleep and Dreaming in 20 Years. Um, so you will find some more information on, on that website. And yeah, so uh, let's invent futuristic sleep and dream technologies. Thank you. Then next up is investigating organized crime. Hey everybody, um, so my name is Friedrich. I work with a group of investigative journalists that's kind of spread throughout um, the world and mainly Eastern Europe. And um, I want to talk about the technology aspects of what we can do to facilitate the work of investigative reporters. Most people in this room will probably first think about um, security aspects, cryptography, but what I'm most interested in is kind of the data analysis aspect of doing this. Um, so for example, a little while ago, um, in early December, we published a series of stories um, about a company called Formations House um, based in the UK that set up all kinds of weird fraudulent schemes around the world. They issued fake Gambian banking licenses or they tried to cut down a forest in Cameroon and grow wheat there and um, all of which was kind of very shady and illegal. Um, but how do we get to these stories, right? How do we kind of get to this evidence? Um, the data that we got was basically a dump of that company's server, right? Coming from a group called Dido Secrets. And um, it comes as zip files, right? Massive zip files where you have millions of emails, you've got documents, you've got even a dump of a MySQL database that they used internally. And how do you go from there to actually having journalism, right? How do you, how do you tell stories based on just random zip files? Um, so you, reporters need access to uh, structured and unstructured data, right? Sometimes data is in documents, sometimes data is also in a structured database, um, and, and people need to be able to see that. Um, then you need to be able to find overlap between data sets, right? So if you have an email in one, in one uh, data set that might be, um, might have a phone number in its signature, right? And that phone number was then in another data set used to set up a company, that might already be the, the crucial connection that you need to find in order to link things and tell good story. And then also this stuff gets really complicated, right? We look into a lot of offshore companies and so um, what we need to do is we need to also keep track of what we're finding. Um, so for a couple of years now we've been working on this thing called the Aleph project and it's at this point kind of a toolkit of different components. Um, there's a search engine um, called Aleph uh, which is basically um, a kind of a graph, knowledge graph explorer that can um, give people access both to, um, both to structured data, unstructured data, um, can do forensics on, on, on large numbers of file types and extract all the kind of useful bits and pieces and show up connectivity between them. Um, it can also do cross-referencing between different data sets, right? So that if you have like a list of all the politicians in a country and you have a list of all the offshore companies and the Panama Papers, you can just kind of go and compare that. 
And we've also been working on this thing called Viz, which is basically for making these little network diagrams where people can kind of keep track of what their stories are. And obviously all of this stuff is free software. And um, I'd really like to find people to work on that, help us, um, especially if you're maybe a pen tester or you want to work on more data import um, mechanisms or better, better data visualizations. Um, one thing that's kind of particularly fun about this um, is that basically underlying all of it is just streams of JSON entities. Um, so you can, you can think about structured data, unstructured data, both as just kind of line-based feeds of, of JSON entities. Um, they're all formatted according to an ontology that we've developed, basically an, a knowledge graph model that we've called follow the money. And so uh, basically a lot of what we do is just convert stuff to this follow the money format and then you can do um, whatever kind of operations you need to do with it. So in this case, for example, you can just pip install um, a thing that downloads all the people f uh, from the 29 leaks, um, the formations house data that I was showing, um, puts them in a JSON file, and then you can take that JSON file with all the people that have been sending and receiving emails in that data dump that I was showing at the beginning, and say, okay, there's those, and then there's the Panama Papers data, uh, published by ICIJ, and you can kind of say, okay, find me possible matches between them. Um, and then you've got yourself a list of candidates, and that's something that a journalist might already want to look at and say, okay, if someone is both involved in dealing with Formations House, but also is involved in, um, in uh, or was uh, mentioned in the Panama Papers, that's good enough for me to spend my time on to give my attention. And um, yeah, so if anyone is interested in hacking on tools for investigative reporters, uh, go to aleftdata.org. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is uh, the very small einmal eins of passwords, one by one, by one, one times one. 101. One times one. One times one, okay. Yeah, I have looked it up. It's a very small one times one of passwords. Um, it's actually a stripped down version of a bigger talk. And um, yeah, um, there are some amazing passwords out there. And um, for me, it's interesting is my password actually working? And how do I manage all these passwords? So let's start with how do we manage all these passwords? Um, we, um, I can strongly recommend using password managers at some point. Um, because with that you can um, set different passwords for each account. You don't lose track which password have I used on which account, in which iteration, and so on and so on. Um, there are a few password managers around. For example, Password Store, um, aka Pass, uh, there's KeePass around. You can also use a notebook uh, if you store that safely at, in some place. Um, yeah, there are lots of uh, possibilities. Unfortunately, uh, you have, still have to remember some passwords to lock the password managers. Um, to unlock the password managers. So if we have a password prompt, um, there's a next thing um, called brute force protection. And that's some sort of mechanism that um, helps um, that uh, the password can't be, can, can't be tried out. So um, yeah, but brute force protection is actually harder than you might think it is. And um, that leads to the right password length um, because long is good but not always practical. Um, and that means I have to determine uh, somehow, how long the, somehow how long my password has to be. And um, maybe we can calculate it, the needed length. Um, maybe you remember the XKCD comic with the um, diceware passphrase where they just add up a um, certain amount of words and say, oh, it's much easier to remember um, uh, uh, some random words from a word list. And uh, the uh, system behind that is diceware because you can 
uh, basically roll a dice to um, five times and then you pick um, a, a word from a list with the number you have um, you have diced and um, yeah um, how is that working uh, basically let's go back to the air shield example in the first slide one two three four five is a number obviously uh, so can I build all my passwords as a number um, if I have a certain amount of characters, we have different number systems with different um, amount of digits or characters in it. So yes, um, those are all numbers. And there is a, um, a formula for that. So you can the amount, you can use the amount of digits in uh, uh, as a power of the length. Um, of your password and you get the uh, amount of combinations. So uh, this is for a 256 bit key in the binary system. It's a huge amount. For a four digit, uh, digit numerical pin, it's obviously a bit fewer um, combinations. And um, now the idea is that we uh, take those amounts and um, make an equation out of it. Then we transform this equation and we get a nice formula um, how many digits uh, we actually need for um, a certain length of password. So let's assume uh, that we use uh, alphanumerical characters. Uh, so we have 56 digits. Um, so for a 256 bit equivalent key, we need uh, 44 characters. And you can try to remember the uh, example in the um, bottom of the slide. It's very hard to remember. So now get back to the diceware. Diceware means we have 7,776 words that can be randomly chosen by either rolling a dice or by using some software. Um, we put that into the formula and we um, get a, a length of 19 words that we need. And um, yeah, you can much easier remember, but the password is a bit longer. And um, yeah, that's for the mass so far. There are some two factor systems around. Um, if you want to secure your passwords even more, you uh, just use two factor with SMS TAN, one time pads, or uh, some uh, unique passwords lists. And uh, always remember biometric attributes are passwords that can't be changed if they have been lost. Um, but on the bright side, um, you can use it, this as a second factor too. And finally, there are application tokens, um, so a second password does not have to be authorized with the user password. Applications tokens are um, not used um, uh, frequently enough, but uh, it's worth a try. And you can find the full 45 minute talks at the archives of the Privacy Week 2019, which was held in Vienna, and uh, I hope I will be there at the next Privacy Week. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this concludes today's lightning talk session. Thank you very much for being here. Please give a big round of applause for all of the speakers who were here on stage today. And again, for having to deal with so many speakers in such a short time, a big round of applause for the translation team.